I know where you sell it. Don't sell it no more. <laughs> sell righteousness. Okay, good evening. This is our last session before the break. And as usual, it is considered a graveyard session, but the pastor resurrected the dead, the bishop, with that sound. Good. All right. Uh, this is a chapter that I'm going to start in the middle. This is the second chapter I'm starting in the middle. I'm going to put those two middles together later on. So we are going to go to chapter, which chapter we should be at now? Chapter 11. But we're going to go to page 95. Page 95, the last paragraph, see in God's rest, that's where we're starting. The first half we'll put together later on. Let me see the hands of those here who can defend the seventh day Sabbath from the New Testament if challenged to. Now, the whole Bible is the Bible, okay? Just before we pray. I saw a chap on YouTube saying that the whole Bible is the Bible. And he used the Old Testament to prove a point he wanted to prove about dress. Okay? Yeah, you didn't have any New Testament text for it. We use this Old Testament text and power it home. And lo and behold, in a debate with a man on the Sabbath, this we tell the man, he doesn't want any Old Testament text, only new. So I want fear people gambling. And which was the only Bible when the apostles were on the earth? What we call the Old Testament. Paul had to prove everything from there. But today, uh, uh, and Jesus too. But today we're going to prove it from the New Testament to shut up that line of argument once and for all. Uh, any new people here to the Sabbath truth? Or everybody here grounded in the Sabbath truth? Everybody here going to the Sabbath truth. Amen. All right. Let's turn to the bottom of page 95, the paragraph entitled Sealed in God's Rest. We will pray and move fairly smoothly. I heard Brother Saul promising you all a quiz. I better give him some questions to pelt in too, to see how you all shape him. That's all right? Yes. Isn't it all right? My young friends, it is not all right. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day so far. Morning, lunch, the lecture just ended. And uh, we thank you for your character of love. And as we explore it now in this section, bless us and teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bottom of page 95, sealed in God's rest. And I have all the text there for you. We can go smoothly on. Let's go. Hebrews 4, verse 3, in the King James Version, the first part. You're following? Yes. I have the text there for you. I can still open it by Billy Fish, but the, but the text is there. Let's read. We are told. Let's read. For we which have believed do enter into rest. Is that clear? How do we enter into rest? By believing. All right. But before verse 3, in that same Hebrews 4, we are told in verses 1 and 2, and I'm reading from the New Living Testament translation. Let's read it now. God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was announced to them. But it did them no good because they did not combine what they heard with faith. Are you following me? Everybody following? The, 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 uh, the bishop will have to add another verse to that sound. The times I used to sleep, I will sleep no more. Okay. All right, everybody moving? Good. Top of page 96. Time to sleep is night. In the, t in the today's English version, translation, verse 2 and verse 3, first part, read us. Still the text is there. This is TEV now. Let's read verse 2. For we have heard the good news just as they did. They heard the message, but it did them no good because when they heard it, they did not accept it with faith. And verse 3, first part, we who believe then 
do receive that rest, do receive that rest which God promised. So the Apostle Paul is there now a clear foundation in the New Testament. We enter into God's rest by faith. And this is the good news. And the Jews did not, the Jewish people did not believe. You see the importance of faith? The new covenant is God's promise and we must believe. They did not mix what they heard with faith. Are you following step by step? Good. Next, next part now. Our Lord Jesus tells us in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. And we're reading again from today's English version. The verse is there. Verse 28. Let's read it. Come unto me, all of you who are tired and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Verse 29. Take my yoke and put it on you and learn from me, character of God, because I'm gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest. Everybody following this line? Continuing now. Entering God's rest means accepting Jesus as one's personal Savior and Lord and surrendering oneself completely, past, present, and future to him to be filled with and controlled by his spirit. It means ceasing the attempt to save oneself by one's own effort and one's apparent goodness and instead, instead accepting the free gift of righteousness. In fact, acknowledging and receiving Christ as our righteousness and therefore being justified by the faith of Jesus and experiencing the new birth. Therefore, it is absolute truth that we can only have and experience God's rest by being in Christ by faith. Are we clear? That's why A.T. Jones says there are Saturday keepers, Sunday keepers, Friday keepers, and a few true Sabbath keepers. I can be a Saturday keeper because I come to church on Saturday, but if I have not entered into the rest by faith in Christ. I'm a Saturday keeper and not a Sabbath keeper. Are you with me? Now the Pharisees put Jesus on the cross Friday afternoon and wish he would hurry up and die so they could go home and keep. They call it a Sabbath. Go home and keep what we would call Saturday. No rest. They did not accept Christ, so they had no rest. They're keeping the Sabbath was a joke. You following the line so far? Okay, let's move. Next paragraph. Righteousness and rest are gifts which are received only by receiving Christ as Savior. We enter God's rest by believing and experiencing the true gospel. Is that clear? If you don't believe the gospel, you have no rest. It doesn't matter which day you keep. Fundamental principles. Now, let's move on now. Having clearly and incontrovertibly shown that we can only enter God's rest by faith, the Apostle Paul now emphatically declares in Hebrews 4, 9, King James Version, let's read it. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. The Greek word translated rest in this verse is the Greek word sabbatismos, which literally means Sabbath rest or the keeping of the Sabbath. But Paul does not stop there, top of page 97. He goes on to say in verse 10, For he that is entered into his rest, everybody read it, he also have ceased from his own works as God did from his. And then back to verse 4, Paul says, verse 4, God did rest the seventh day from all his works. All in the New Testament. All the, this is the Apostle Paul that they like to accuse as the man that abolished the Sabbath. Next paragraph. This brings us to another inescapable conclusion, and it is this. Entering into God's rest by faith can only be correctly celebrated by the observance of the creation seventh-day Sabbath. Are we clear? Straight line. All the text there for you. Can't get away. Next paragraph. It should be absolutely clear then that Seventh-day Sabbath keeping is not legalism, as many religionists say. Rather, it is the celebration of entering into Christ's gospel rest by faith. 
the TEV translation of Hebrews 4, 9, and 10 reads this way. Let's read it. Verse 9. As it is, however, there we still remains for God's people a rest like God's resting on the seventh day. Verse 10. For whosoever receives that rest which God promised will rest from his own work just as God rested from his. Clear? You want it any clearer? All right. Thus, this means that the outward manifestation of the inner rest of the gospel is keeping the seventh day Sabbath holy. Now, I want you to get some time and read Appendix A, Appendix A in the back of the book, where people try to use Colossians 2 to try to say that Paul abolished the Sabbath. Okay? And in Colossians 2 14, let no man judge you. Uh, we, we have a particular way of dealing with it, which is all right. But I heard a fellow called David Wilbur, who is a Jewish Christian, accepting the Messiah and so on, give a line on what Paul was saying that I will share with you later on. It is amazing. It ties in with ours, but he mentions some things that you might miss when you read Paul. But another time. But make sure you can answer Colossians too. When they come. Okay, but we'll deal with that in the appendix. Okay, let's move on now. Learning of Christ. We just had the character of God. In Matthew, everybody follow that line then? So if I wake you up tonight at midnight, you can give me Paul's line of Sabbath proof. I ain't hearing a soul. I ain't gonna wake you up at midnight. The final crisis is gonna wake us all up at midnight. And haul before the court and the judge saying, you hear a Sunday law pass, you still keeping the seventh day Sabbath, that old Jewish relic. Let me hear you talk. And you have to stand up before judges and authorities and give a reason for the faith that is in you. All right. Learning of Christ, page 97, the bottom. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus invites us to learn of him, for he is meek and lowly of heart, and we shall find rest to our souls. That is a very serious text. When somebody troubles us, why do we get on rest? Because we depart from meekness and lowliness, and as Brother Austin just said, try to defend or exalt ourselves. All of us. We need to be cured of it by the same righteousness of Christ and learning of him. I think Brother MacLean mentioned this thing, the experience. We must experience this meekness and lowliness of our by learning it. Now if a mouse teacher is teaching you something all the time and never gives you some practice, will you be cemented in the mouse? Every community teacher never gives you six problems to do. You have to practice the problems. Jesus has won the victory for us and has given us the victory, but we must use the formula to practice defeating the enemy. So we are to learn of Jesus that he's meek and lowly of our. And when somebody troubles you, the world says, count to ten. The Bible says, reckon yourself dead. Okay? So Jesus had to reckon himself as, as the man in our human nature, dead to all around. Remember when the news came, Lazarus real sick. And Mary and Martha would wish that you stop preaching now and come straight to, to, to Lazarus. He's your good friend. That's the only house to go and get some food because Jesus is sleeping in a hill. Okay? And the news from heaven was, Jesus, continue preaching till I tell you when to go. Jesus continued preaching. Hear the disciples. Well, hear us. Us now, what kind of question he is? He heard that Lazarus there and he's still preaching? You see, I've got to be in tune with heaven, whatever people say. Then when the Spirit said, now is the time to go, and Jesus said, let's go, hear the disciples, my man dead now. What are you going to do? And Jesus gone. And Jesus said, now what is about to happen is to glorify God. And give the ultimate evidence to these hard-hearted Pharisees that I am the Messiah. And when they reject it, they will write off themselves and the Jewish nation. Okay? For, for example, we are told that when the Sunday laws are passed, and we go before the court and we get fined, the Spirit will be in control when we are in Christ, and the Spirit may tell us, pay the fine 
go in another area and preach. In a sense, go in jail. So we have to be so spirit-filled and in God's rest at that time that the spirit will be directing us in the word as to what to do as it did Jesus. Okay. Let's continue now. Still the bottom of page 97. Okay. This wonderful humility of the Son of God was manifested in his submission to his Father for the creation of the universe. That's why I'm going to tie the first half of this chapter with the first half of the other one that I did a latter half uh, on Sabbath. All right. The Father created all creation through his Son, Colossians 1.16 and John 1.1-3. 1, 1 in fact, there are seven times the New Testament tells us that the Son of God was the active agent by whom the Father made all things. You all know all seven? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, hmm? You got them written down? Yeah. Okay. All right. We, we should know the obvious one. In the beginning was the yeah. Word, and the Word was with God. God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was nothing made. Okay? Now, was the Sabbath made? But Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man. So if the Sabbath was made, and all things that were made were made by Jesus, the Son of God, who made the Sabbath? The Son of God. Okay? You see, our Sunday-keeping friends whom we love like to talk about Sabbath is Old Testament. It belonged to the Jews. Now who kept the first Sabbath? We come to that soon. Who kept the first Sabbath? A Jew? Man? Who kept the first Sabbath? God himself blessed it, rested on it, and kept it. And Jesus said it was made for man. And, and God did that, okay? And Adam did it, and Jesus said it was made for mankind. Okay? Okay. Let's continue. Our planet Earth with its solar system was created after the satanic rebellion in heaven. You know that? Our solar system and planet Earth and mankind were created after Satan rebelled and was cast out of heaven. Listen to this from Patriots and Prophets 36 2. Before the, before the assembled inhabitants of heaven, the king declared that none but Christ, the only begotten of God, could fully enter his purposes. And to him it was committed to execute the mighty counsels of his will. We, we can come back to this on Sabbath. Okay? Because people, people either get confused on this or build up a false doctrine on it. Okay? So we can clear it up. You following this, 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 this statement? The Son of God had wrought the Father's will in the creation of all the hosts of heaven. And to him as well as to God, their homage and allegiance were due. Christ was still to exercise divine power in the creation of the earth and its inhabitants. But in all this, he would not seek power or exaltation for himself contrary to God's plan, but would exalt the Father's glory and execute his purposes of beneficence and love. You see this? Everything the Son did, he exalted the Father's glory. But you tell me, wasn't the Son equal with the Father? That didn't concern the Son. The Son did not think it something to grasp, to claim equality with God. He exalted the Father. You see that? And then when the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit said, I'm come to talk about myself exalting the Son. And anytime the Father taught, the Father exalted the Son. So each person is selfless. They're dead to self. If you use that expression. But they don't, they don't have any self to be dead to God. They're selfless, innately. And this is the example for us. This is amazing. Well, somebody came out and said, good rabbi, and Jesus said, don't call me good, there's none good but my father. You see that self-emptying? Wow. Okay. Everybody following? Good. The Son of God made the Sabbath. Mark 2, 27 and 28. John 1, 1 to 3. Genesis 2, 1 to 3. 
In Mark 2, 27 and 28, Jesus informs us that the creation Sabbath was made for man. Since all things that were made were made by the Son of God, this means that the Son of God made the seventh day creation Sabbath, and he's therefore Lord of the Sabbath. Now, let me tell you something. Tonight, when we touch on how the mystery of iniquity developed, you'll see that a man like Diotrephes that John's mentioned, John mentions in 3 John verse 9, and some other early Christians early started giving John and Paul trouble. So Paul said, even in his day, the mystery of iniquity has started to work. And after the apostles died, Paul said in Acts that after his departure, grievous wolves would attack from outside, and from among yourselves will men rise up, preaching perverse things. We are told that after the apostles died off, some men used this argument, the Jews getting persecuted, and the Romans mixing up with us with the Jews, and one of the hallmarks of the Jews is Seventh-day Sabbath keeping. Let us distinguish ourselves from them by keeping Sunday as the resurrection day and calling it the Lord's day. You see that reasoning? Satan likes to use a religious guise to rebel against God. When Samuel asked Saul, why you brought back all these things that God tell you don't bring back one thing from that place? This is what Samuel said. The sheep and thing look good, so I bring them back to sacrifice. Saul, the sheep and thing look good, so I bring them back to sacrifice. A religious guise for disobeying God. So here all our Sunday keeping friends say, don't mind those uh, Adventists. We keep the Lord's day in honor of the resurrection, which command says so. So it is Satan's trick to use religious false reasoning to rebel against God. What did he tell Jesus? It is written that if you throw down yourself from this building, God will send his angels to prevent you from hurting your feet on the ground. Quoting the text to Jesus. Jesus says, there's also written that you should not be presumptuous. Why do I throw myself from this building for God to keep me up? You heard that? Okay, let's go. So we're continuing here on page 98. Next paragraph. Before the entrance of sin into our world, follow this carefully, the creation on earth was in perfect harmony with its creator, and there was perfect rest. You got that rest? When God had finished, everything was perfectly good. There was perfect harmony between God and the creation. Every tree, every bird, every shark, every lion, everything was in perfect peace and rest. Did Adam have to be afraid of lions? No, everything was under the dominion of man and under the spirit of God. What proves that that is still so? The other day we heard a story of a tiger that had a baby, baby tiger cub, and the baby was then. And it took its cub in its mouth and searched and searched and searched till it found a human habitation, saw a farmer and took it to the farmer. But if you don't believe that now, my wife has a dog that had seven puppies. I didn't know, it. I didn't believe it could get two because it's a small dog, but it had seven. And one of the puppies was in trouble. And it took up that puppy and brought it and put it in my wife's hand. And she had to nurse it, uh, give it milk through a, a syringe and everything. We had to do that. So she, it was the smallest of the puppies, so she called it Runty. And now you should see Runty running about and barking. But the mother had the instinct to bring it to a human being. And it happened in the wild, it happened in nature. Still reminding us that God put the creation under man. Man was to have dominion. Okay? The theory of evolution can't explain that. But Genesis tells us about it. Even though we are in a fallen condition, the animals still have the instinct that man was in control. Back to here then. Praise the Lord. All right. So before the entrance of sin into our world, the creation on earth was in perfect harmony with its creator and there was perfect rest. After the fall, mankind, listen to this carefully. After the fall, mankind lost righteousness and rest. You got that? 
which could only be restored through the plan of redemption centered in Christ. And as we have shown from Hebrews 4, the believer enters into God's rest by faith in Jesus, who is Lord of the Sabbath. Everybody clear? Sin took away righteousness and rest, which can only be restored now in and through Jesus Christ. Is everybody clear? Sabbath rest principles. Before we come on to the section on uh, how much time, how the time going, um, Miss Timekeeper? 20 minutes. Again. Okay. Sabbath rest principles. Entering God's rest. Look at the bottom of page 98. Entering God's rest means acceptance of and surrender to Jesus as our burden bearer, problem solver, and plan maker. Is that clear? All right. Tenderly, he bid his, the toiling people, the top of page 99, keep following. Tenderly, he bid the toiling people, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Matthew eleven twenty nine. We're reading from Ministry of Healing. With these words, Christ was speaking to every human being. Follow now. Whether they know it or not, all are weary and heavy laden. Is that not so? Especially in these days, all are weighed down with burdens that only Christ can remove. Is that clear? All of us. The heaviest burden that we have to, that we bear is the burden of sin. And if we were left to bear this burden, it would crush us. But the sinless one has taken our place. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hallelujah. You heard the story of a man one time that was uh, in the old time days. He had a big load on his head and it was really heavy. He wanted some help and a man passed on a donkey car and gave him a lift. And he got in the donkey car and sat down but still had the load on his head. He man said, what were you, were you asked for the lift for? Put the load on the car. You see that little story? It was a true story from the 1920s. Sometimes we accept Christ as Savior but still want to carry the load of sin. Christ is the sin bearer. We cannot atone for our guilt. Christ has done it and we must believe and enter into rest by faith in him. Amen. Continuing now. He has borne the burden of our guilt. Praise the Lord. We see where we are. He has borne the burden of our guilt. He will take the load from our weary shoulders. He will give us rest. You see Sabbath rest? The burden of care and sorrow, also he will bear. And we all have sorrow and care. Your parents are dealing with children. Children is one, one challenge at one age, another challenge at another age, and a third challenge at another age. And the wife said she had a son that she had a prayer and prayer and prayer, and he didn't get his heart to the Lord till he was 40. And she said the thing was that everybody was visualizing, he's the perfect son, look how bad he is. You know, you know the saints? You think the saints easy? We all have burdens to bear, but he will give us rest. The burden of care and sorrow he will bear. He invites us to cast all our care upon him, for he cares, for he carries us upon his heart. The King James Version, he cares for us. Praise the Lord. Cast all of our care on him. The elder brother of our race is by the eternal throne. Where is Jesus now? By the eternal throne. He looks upon every soul who is turning his face toward him as Savior. So we to keep our focus on Jesus. Praise the Lord. He knows by experience. It was McLean's point this morning. He knows by experience what are the weaknesses of humanity. That is why he took our flesh. What are our wants? And where lies the strength of our temptations? For he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15 He's watching over you, trembling child of God. Everybody got this? He's watching over me and you, trembling child of God. Are you tempted? He will deliver. Are you weak? He will strengthen. Are you ignorant? He will enlighten. Are you wounded? He will heal. Hallelujah! The Lord telleth the number of the stars, and yet he healeth the broken in heart. 
and bind up their wounds. Psalm 147, 4 and 3, Ministry of Healing 75, 71, paragraph 5. Continue. Whatever your anxieties and trials, spread out your care, your case before the Lord. Back there in our Barbados camp, a friend of mine from North America uh, told me she was convicted to come to our camp. And she had issues in her mind. You know, you know, all of us have issues in life. And she said, by the end of the camp, I'm going through all of these sessions, all, all, the, all the lectures and so on. She had a renewed experience. Thank the Lord. A renewed experience. Whatever your anxieties and trials, spread out your case before the Lord. Your spirit will be braced for endurance. See, everybody read it. The way will be open for you to disentangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. You see, do you see the character of God? Do you see the character of God? The point that Brother Austin was just stressing, how, how different ours is from that, and we must have that character. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be. Listen to this one at the top of page 100. We don't have long to go now. The top of page 100. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger you will become in his strength. You didn't read that one. People were dozing. So let's read it again. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger you will become in his strength. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed the rest in casting them upon your burden bearer. Oh, praise the Lord. Thy maker is thy husband. Listen carefully now, because this chapter is entitled the wedding ring or the wedding seal. In our culture, the, the, the bride dresses up. In spiritual culture, we must have one the wedding garment. In our culture, the bride gets a ring, some cultures have some other kind of seal. Uh, we know the ring is controversial, but we're dealing now with the principle. A seal of ownership. Okay? So let's move on. For thy maker is thy husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. So who's our husband? Our maker. Who made all things? The Son of God. God, through, God the Father through the Son. And we must put on our wedding garment to be, when we are married to him, we have on the wedding garment. And now we come to the wedding seal or ring. Let's continue. Christ is the maker and husband of his church, which is his body, his wife. Christ and his church are one. The church enters God's rest by faith in Christ, who is Lord of the Sabbath. Therefore, the seventh day Sabbath can be the only true Lord's day for his church. Are you clear? The seventh day Sabbath is the sign or seal or wedding ring which shows that the remnant church is married to its maker, redeemer, and sanctifier, the Lord Jesus Christ. The church must have on the wedding garment and show the seal, sign, or wedding ring of her marriage to Christ. So the Son of God speaking in Ezekiel 20, 12 said, Moreover, also, let's read it together. Moreover, also, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign in Hebrew, the sign, ring, and seal all mean the same thing, to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. Ezekiel 20, 12. And verse 20, and hallow my Sabbaths, and there shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Jehovah, your God. Is that clear? Praise the Lord. All right, so the last section now. If he's our husband, there must be spiritual intimacy. If he's our spiritual husband, okay? Listen to this now as we close off. How the time going? Ten minutes again, okay. Spiritual intimacy in the most holy place, follow. To be living Christians, everybody follow now, last few minutes. To be living Christians, we must have a vital connection with Christ. The true believer can say, I know that my Redeemer liveth. The text that Brother Newton quoted from Job. This intimate communion with our Savior will take away the desire for earthly and sensual gratifications. 
all our powers of body, soul, and spirit should be devoted to God. Is that clear? When the affections are sanctified, our obligations to God are made primary, everything else secondary. To have a steady and ever-growing love for God and a clear perception of his character and attributes, we must keep the eye of faith fixed constantly on him. Christ is the life of the soul. We must be in him and he in us, else we are sapless branches. Whoa. You see the intimacy? Yeah. And this is what is meant by having on that wedding garment and having the wedding seal or band. Okay? Let's continue. Christ must be ever in our thoughts. Watch this. Watch this. Christ must ever be in our thoughts. Whoa. You see the standard we have to reach? And it isn't done by force. We have to love him because he first loved us and he must always be in our thoughts. We must all converse with him while we walk by the way and while our hands are engaged in labor. So while working during the day, we can still have him in our thoughts and communicate with him at the level of our thoughts. In all the purposes and pursuits of life, we must inquire, what will the Lord have me to do? How shall I please him who has given his life for a ransom for me? Thus we may walk with God. Listen, as did Enoch of old, and ours may be the testimony which he received, that he pleased God. And not only he pleased God, what happened to Enoch? He was translated. Imagine a man being translated before the cross. Whoa. And this one I like. I like to read this. If I don't read this on morning, I read it back at night. This little quotation from uh, Review and Herald I have here. Listen to it. To comprehend and enjoy God is the highest exercise of the powers of man. Read it again. Let's read it together. If you're sleeping, open up and read it. To comprehend and enjoy God is the highest exercise of the powers of man. Wow. Do you enjoy God? Do we enjoy God? People come to church and in two tools they sit bored, but they sit down and watch TV for six hours. Fall asleep watching TV. Wow. Let's continue. What will the Lord have me to do? How shall I please him who has given his life a ransom for me? Thus we may walk with God as did Enoch of old. And he had a testimony that he pleased God. To comprehend, and going over this again, to comprehend and enjoy God is the highest exercise of the powers of man. This may be attained only when our affections are sanctified and ennobled by the grace of Christ. No man know of the Father but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. In Christ, was, in Christ was God manifested in the flesh, reconciling the world unto himself. In Christ was the brightness of his Father's glory, the express image of his person. Said our Savior, he that have seen me have seen the Father. In Christ is the life of the soul. Let's read this part together now. In the outgoings of our hearts to him, in our earnest, affectionate yearnings for his excellence, in our eager searching into his glory, we find life. In communion with him, we eat the bread of life. So God loves us to be thinking of him and trying to find out more of him and trying to search out what we can find, but that very exercise draws us closer to him. And over the page, 102. When we allow objects of minor importance to absorb our attention to the forgetfulness of Christ, turning away from him to accept other companionships, we set our feet in a path which leads away from God and from heaven. You got that? What were the passages saying that? Whatever you're buying, selling, smoking, doing, dressing, that pulling you away from God, they got to do it no more. Christ must be the central object of our affections, and then we shall live in him. Then we shall have his spirit and follow his example. All of this, all of this is coming from Review and Herald, May 30, 
1882. Let's continue and try and finish off now two minutes. If we walk in the light, we must follow Jesus, the light of life. What constitutes the brightness of heaven? And what will consist the happiness of the redeemed? Christ is all and in all. They will gaze with rapture unutterable upon the Lamb of God. They will pour out their sounds of grateful praise and adoration to him whom they loved and worship here. You hear that? Whom they loved and worship here. That sound they learned and began to sing on earth. They learned to put their trust in Jesus while they were forming characters for heaven. Their hearts were attuned to his will here. Their joy in Christ will be proportioned to the love and trust which they learn to repose in him here. You see that statement? You understand what that statement said? I don't think so. This statement is telling us that in heaven, some people, listen carefully, some people who are saved, we are all saved, but some people will be ahead of others in the joy they are finding in Christ because of the joy they learned of him here. Well, well, well. That's also a direct statement on that display of prophecy. A living Christian will cultivate gratitude of heart, giving thanks. Psychiatrists now tell us that as an attitude of gratitude and peace and thankfulness is one of the best things you can do for your mental health. Self-centeredness is a cause, a root cause of uh, most, a lot of mental disabilities. Everything focusing on yourself. All right, let's continue. A living Christian will cultivate gratitude of heart. He will seriously, earnestly recount the blessings of his life and the precious results of all his affections. He will recall every occasion upon which the hand of Christ lifted up a standard for him against the enemy. You look back over your life and see the times that God spared your life from some danger. I will never forget as a little boy, but my grandson does the same thing now. So you see, I, I gone on the beach. Somebody threw away an egg. And I gone on the beach and pick up the egg and crack it. The body thought it was addle. Well, you know we call it addle. But lo and behold, when I cracked the egg, I saw the chicken inside living. And I ran across the road to show my mother. And a man stood up coming to my mother. Your son ran across the road to show that chicken and that egg. Jane Hines care miss him by a millimeter. Thank the Lord for his mercy. Jane Hines, by the way, was married to my aunt Dora Hines. So it would have big it would have been a big mourning. By a millimeter, the man said, I ain't seen the car yet. Thank God for his mercies. And I'm sure all of us can recount our lives when from dangers known and unknown, God protected us. So we continue. The great love of Jesus, the infinite sacrifice made for man's redemption, will be an unfailing theme for grateful, humble praise. Last paragraph. Now let's read this together. Those who are learning at the feet of Jesus will surely exemplify by their deportment and conversation the character of Christ. So repeating some of the principles that Brother Austin just went through. Their spiritual life is sustained in the closet by secret communion with God. Their experience is marked less with bustle and excitement than with a subdued and reverent joy. Their love for Christ is a quiet, peaceful, yet all-controlling power. The light and love of an indwelling Savior are revealed in every word and every act. Outward troubles cannot reach that life which we live by faith on the Son of God. Its richest, purest joys are felt when Christ is the theme of thought and conversation. Sabbath rest, the wedding ring of our marriage. And the first part of this chapter, I will tell you the first part of a former chapter in deeper things later on. So tonight we are going to be uh, looking at chapter 12. God bless you all. Make sure you are able to prove from the New Testament and the Old the Sabbath truth. And above all, you enter into God's rest by faith in Jesus Christ. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. And we pray in his name. We enter into the most holy place in his name and by his merits we have no righteousness but his. And we can only enter rest when we believe and enter into him having his righteousness as the wedding garment and his rest of soul as the wedding ring which is manifested in keeping the creation seventh day sabbath holy we thank you give us rest of spirit and soul and may we lay all of our burdens on you because you care for us and you carry us not only in the palms of your hands, but in your heart. Give us a good break now, and then through supper time, bless that event, and then bring us back at 7.15 for our last session. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. God bless you all.